Hi, Willie, just joining. Good luck, man. Oh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Morning Rounds. Um, this morning we have one of our um, cardiology residents, uh, Dr. Willie Wang, who will be presenting. Um, Willie's in his uh, final year of his cardiology training and will be uh, pursuing uh, training in EP starting uh, this summer. Um, he's going to speak with us today on uh, uh, pacemaker technology, uh, setting the pace for the future. So welcome, Willie. Good morning. So hi, everyone. I'm Willie, one of the uh, C3s. Uh, as Dr. Stadnik said in the introduction, I'll be talking today about uh, some uh, future pacing technologies. I just wanted a thumbs up from everyone to make sure I can see this, uh, everyone can see my slides. Yes, we can see them. Okay, <clears throat> okay so a uh, brief, uh, brief introduction uh, of objectives today. So first, we're going to start with just a brief background on uh, pacemakers. Then we'll jump into leadless pacemakers. You'll notice I have a the plural in a bracket. And we'll talk about some novel leadless technology that are more in uh, under investigation rather than in true clinical practice. And then lastly, we'll talk about conduction system pacing, also known as uh, physiologic pacing. So as a background, the first human pacemaker was implanted in 1958 in Sweden by setting it out. Uh, currently, about a million pacemakers are implanted per year worldwide. In Canada, that number is about 18,000, uh, according to Kaihai data from 2018. Although in the United States and worldwide, the prevalence of pacemakers is increasing. Our rate of implantation actually has stayed stable in the last few years at a rate of about 50 to uh, mid 50s per 100,000. <coughs> so uh, as we all know, um, pacemakers aren't without complications. So in this 1500 patient uh, cohort in Denmark, they found that uh, the complication rate uh, uh, of the acute procedure is about 3%, the most common being pneumothorax followed by perfusion or in cardiac effusion. 5% uh, rate of lead related complications, the most common actually being electrical thresh threshold issues, the next most common being dislodgements and then lead fractures. And then of course there are the pocket related complications, the most common by far being hematoma and far less likely but still prevalent is uh, infection 0.9% within two months and 0.8% thereafter. Uh, the PADDIT study uh, demonstrated a 0.4% per year infection rate of a pacemaker at one year. <coughs> uh, this nationwide cohort of 46,000 patients in uh, Denmark over a course of about 30 years demonstrated um, a annualized rate of about 0.48 in the first year and then after the first year it kind of bottoms out so uh, around a 0.1 percent chance per year of infection we know that mortality after a, uh, a, a cardiac device infection can be quite high up to 20 to 30 percent is seen in these km survival curves obviously an endovascular infection is far worse than a pocket infection but both still uh, carry a significance there's also less common complications, so tricuspid uh, regurgitation from uh, lead impingement or fibrosis, as well as uh, venous occlusion. Estimates have included uh, uh, figures such as a quarter of patients having TR grade worsening by one grade and 18% TR worsening by two grades. Venous obstruction can occur partially uh, in up to a third of patients, and complete obstruction is reported as frequently as 9%. Which begs the question, can we get by without transvenous leads? So the idea of leadless pacemakers has actually been around since the late 1960s. Splicker et al. Uh, put a leadless device into a dog. This is the uh, their implant system in 1970 using a mercury battery. They also toyed with the idea of a nuclear powered intracardiac pacemaker leadless, 
Uh, the battery life was about three years on this, again, in the late 1960s. We've come quite a ways. Uh, in December 2012 was the first human implant of a leadless pacemaker. And as of uh, November 2019, there's been about 50,000 micros by Medtronic that have been implanted worldwide. So we'll go over the uh, two available, uh, I say available tentatively, uh, leadless pacemakers. So the first is the Nanostem LCP by St. Jude. LCP stands for Leadless Cardiac Pacemaker. It's about a uh, 4, 42 millimeter by 6 millimeter device, as seen here. It's about one milliliter in displacement, two grams in weight, and is implanted with a 21 French catheter system. It has a rate response rate response feature by measuring temperature in the blood and the prime then the fixation mechanism is actually a helix with a screw uh, sorry a helix with a spring at the end so the device is simply just torqued into the rv apex the second available device is the micro tps the tps standing for transcatheter pacing system and it's made by medtronic you see the fixation uh, device is a bit different it uses these nitinol tines that basically implanted the RV wall. The size is similar. It's shorter, but a bit wider. So it's 26 millimeters in length and 6.7 in diameter. Its displacement is similar at about 0.8 milliliters. Its uh, weight is two grams and it's implanted with a larger sheath as expected since the device itself is larger in uh, diameter. Its rate response is based on accelerometer. And this becomes an important feature later on. <coughs> This is a picture of the uh, delivery system. So on top is the nanostim and on the bottom is the micro. The salient uh, things to point out here are the nanostim has a docking button. And when it's originally implanted, it's uh, there's a tether that keeps it onto the delivery sheath and this tether is cut. Both sheets are deflectible sheaths. With the micro, uh, the salient feature to point out is this delivery cone. So this, this uh, cone sits in this large sheath and when the device is first introduced in the body, the whole device sits inside the sheath to protect the, the tines and it gets uh, pushed out of the sheath into the RV. And this recapture cone has a tether running through it, which do, uh, links up to a docking button as well. And when the, when the, the device is ready to be released, mm -hmm. that tether is cut as well. So we'll go over the nanostem first. This is the Nanostim, uh, our uh, New England Journal paper that led to its approval, the Leadless 2 study. They found that the acute success implant rate was about 96%. However, 30% requ uh, required acute repositioning. So intra-procedure, it had to be re-implanted, but not afterwards. This is the data showing the, uh, the safety, because obviously with any new technology, we want to know, uh, is it safe? Uh, the overall complication rate was 6.5%. The perforation rate is about 1.6%, so eight patients had perforation. There were six vascular complications uh, to be expected given the large sheath size. Uh, of note, there were two procedure-related mortality, one due to access infection and one due to tampon that actually needed a pericardiocentesis and the patient subsequently had a stroke. Uh, busy table, but the only thing I wanted to point out was there was a uh, small rate of device dislodgement. Luckily, all of them were able to be retrieved at a subsequent procedure. Um, in the course of this study, the implantation globally was actually paused in 2014 because of the perforation that I mentioned above. Uh, they temporarily paused the study and had a retraining program for implanting uh, physicians. And as part of that, they did a safety analysis. So among the, pay, uh, the implants that happened after the study pause, the, uh, the rates of uh, complications actually did go down. So the number of reposition attempts went down, the perforation risk decreased, and the dislodgement rate also decreased. Unfortunately, St. Jude has a second issue. Uh, in October 2016, they issued a global, uh, a global stop on implant. This was due to premature uh, battery failure. Um, when they explanted the devices, they found that it was uh, likely due to a loss of electrolytes from the lithium carbon monofluoride batteries. This actually is the same composition used in regular button cells, for example, in watches. So out of 1,400 devices that have been implanted, 
34 had premature battery failure. Uh, out of the 34, seven of the devices actually lost communication pacing functions quite suddenly, and six patients were symptomatic from bradycardia and needed intervention. The mean time of failure was about 2.9 years. All the failures were actually more than 2.3 years, so certainly uh, concerning. Uh, unfortunately, during the pause, um, there was uh, more issues discovered. They discovered that two patients actually had that docking button uh, fly off and embolize into the lungs. So they, the implants hadn't, be re hadn't been resumed at this point, but given this issue, they continued the hold. As of 2016, the uh, nanostim approval uh, process has been stopped as the uh, St. Jude has pulled the uh, application for uh, approval in Canada. And the nanosim currently is not available for implant worldwide. The second uh, system is the micro TPS, which is made by Medtronic. It was approved in Europe in 2015 and approved in the United States in 2016. The first human implant was December 2013, so a full 12 months after uh, the first implant of the nanostim. As mentioned uh, before, it's a shorter and wider device, and it's got different fixation mechanism, being nitinol fixation leads. Um, one thing to point out is that they did not actually develop a, a dedicated retrieval catheter system, but uh, we'll go over this uh, in a little bit. So this is the article that led to the approval, the micro TPS study. The acute implant rate was 99.2%. Uh, the original paper actually only included safety data points up to six months, so we see the number at risk drops off here at six months. Um, but they did a 12-month full stay of safety analysis. <clears throat> the major complication rate is about 4%. The important ones being uh, a 0.7% uh, incidence rate of groin uh, complications. The effusion perforation rate was about 1.5%. Six patients, they included this as a complication, had pacing-induced CHF, and actually two had pacemaker syndrome as well. Uh, there was no dislodgement noted. They only had one death. This death was actually felt to be due to combination of end-stage renal disease, metabolic acidosis from a prolonged procedure time, so not directly device-related. They followed, post-approval, they followed a larger cohort of 1,800 patients for about three years. Uh, again, they found a 99.1% implant success rate. The major complication rate went down to about 2.3%. Uh, again, so there were some growing complications. The, there were actually 14 effusions, but of the 14, they only classified eight as major complications uh, because these eight patients needed pericaryocentesis. The, uh, the other patients did not need any intervention. <clears throat> Uh, there were two effusions that needed to be repaired surgically, and unfortunately, both those patients passed away. There was one dislodgement and embolization. This was successfully repositioned. Um, as mentioned, the complication rate, 2.3%, was actually 60% 60, 60 reduced compared to the pre-approval study. And the effusion rate, uh, of, uh, the total effusion of 0.8, so not the major effusion rate, but the total effusion rate also went down from 1.5% to about 0.78, so all encouraging trends. Currently, the uh, the, uh, nano, uh, the micro is approved for implant in uh, Canada. <coughs> so, is the Lido's pacemaker better than the transvenous? As part of the safety analysis, they included a historical uh, cohort of uh, transvenous pacemakers, so about 2,600 patients. Um, also interesting in this curve, they analyzed separately the pre-approval and post-approval devices. So the pre-approval device here is in the dark dark blue. So this is the original micro TPS study. Um, so you see that the lowest rate of complications actually was post-approval as uh, you know we presume as people had more experience implanting, the complication rate went down. Overall, they found that the major complication rate was lower in lead list pacemakers, so 4% versus 7.6% at 12 months. The leadless ones uh, had obviously more femoral vein complications, as well had a higher perforation risk at about two times. The short-term complication rate at two months was felt to be similar, uh, not shown in this graph, at about 4.8% in the leadless and 4.1% in the transvenous. However, after two months, complication rate was 0.2 in the lethal systems and 3.3, 3.1 in the transvenous systems. 
This is a meta-analysis of 28 studies, <coughs> mostly looking at the perforation risk of transvenous pacemakers. So uh, mean and median are shown in the yellow here, compared with the perforation risk in the uh, with the leadless. So as mentioned before, about double the perforation risk, 1.5 versus 0.8. So one of the important questions that comes up is, once we put it in, can we actually take it out? So as part of the device advisory for the nanostim, they didn't just specifically direct clinicians to leave it in or take it out, but they essentially said, <clears throat> it's up to the clinicians whether or not they want to keep it in or take it out. So a good number of people had a retrieval attempts. So they did an analysis on all retrieval attempts of the nanostim. So 66 were successful, seven were unsuccessful for an overall success rate of 90%. Pre-advisory, the most common reason for retrieval is elevated pacing threshold, eight out of 20. Post-advisory, the majority were for prophylactic purposes. So 46 out of 53 were done for prophylactic purposes. As part of the analysis, they found that there was no, uh, there was no relationship between the duration of the implant and the success rate of the retrieval. So they did not find that the longer the nanostim was in, the harder it was to retrieve. Uh, the other thing they looked at was the inexperience of operators. So half the operators actually had no prior retrieval experience, yet their success rate was 92%, so no lower than the average, uh, the average success rate. The other thing to talk about is the uh, why were they unsuccessful? Uh, of the six failure to retrieves, uh, five of them were for anatomical reasons. Essentially, the docking button was either tucked underneath the tricuspid valve where they couldn't get it, or it was uh, kind of buried in the inferior aspect of the right ventricle. Uh, as mentioned before, there was a rate of docking button embolization. So in one patient, the docking button actually fell off um, while they were trying to retrieve it. So they had to abandon the attempt. And the last thing to mention that is that there were no uh, no pericardial fusions noted as part of the retrieval attempts. Now, micro-TPS retrieval, as mentioned previously, there's no dedicated retrieval system, but people quickly realized that they could use that little cup and just uh, use the delivery sheath in order to retrieve. So they, instead of using, uh, using the tether, they leave the lumen of the cup open, and then they put a snare in and they bring a snare in and they snare the docking button and they basically pull the device back into the sheath. They can, they also, a lot of clinicians will forego the cup system and just use the, the delivery sheath and in that put a flexible, a, a deflectible sheath inside in order to be able to maneuver better and then put a snare through the deflectible sheath. Uh, we'll have some examples coming up. Uh, a smaller cohort, but out of these 40 patients, they found that uh, 40 out of 40 were able to have the device retrieved. Having said that, uh, there were important uh, differences in the populations. So looking at the attempts, so again, 73 attempts in the nanostems, 40 in the micros. Uh, the reason for retrieval in the nanostem a lot were for prophylactic reasons, whereas the reasons for retrieval in micros were more clinically indicated, given that there was no device uh, advisory. So the most common being increased threshold. <coughs> So the different populations, uh, the nanostims were actually in for a median of uh, about six, uh, about 600 days. Sorry, sorry, about 200 days. And the micro was about 46 days. So because of the nature of the retrievals, the nanostims had been in quite a bit longer. The success rate was a little bit lower in the nanostim uh, group. As mentioned before, five were unable to be retrieved, whereas in the micro, there were no failures to retrieve. Uh, I'll show you an example of a routine retrieval. So to walk through the system, this is the delivery sheath, which is the largest sheath. And then this is a, an a, a NXT Agilis deflectible sheath. And through that, a snare is introduced to grab the docking button of the micro. <coughs> so you can see the device is getting, is getting pulled and it is uh, kept tight to the Agilis and withdrawn into the delivery sheath as one. Well, let's play one more time. This is what it looks like on ice. So this is the yellow is the quadrupolar EP catheter, the red is the micro, and the green is the snare that's grabbing onto the proximal portion. <clears throat> 
this is a nice of a post procedure uh, echo. So here there is a bit of uh, tissue remaining. Uh, the, the authors uh, presume that this is some early forming encapsulation uh, material. And this is the actual picture of that device from the previous uh, slides. We'll show a case of unusual embolization. Uh, this is a case of a uh, device that actually embolized into the left pulmonary artery. <clears throat> so as, as before, the introducer sheath is placed in with the, the Agilis uh, deflectible sheath. Uh, because it's in the left PA, they had to use a, mul a multipurpose catheter. They actually also needed to use a whisper wire in order to get everything in place. And they put a single loop snare up to the pulmonary artery. Uh, interesting in this case, they actually, they started by trying to snare one of the tines uh, they were able to get it into the right atrium, but then the time straightened out and then the device went flying off again and landed here. So this is actually a picture of their second retrieval attempt, but everything uh, turned out well for this patient. So can a micro be replaced uh, in the same procedure? So uh, there have been reported cases where a patient who has a, a uh, who needs an elective replacement for battery depletion uh, in this specific patient, this uh, was after 47 months. Uh, what they did here, this is the old device. So they put a new device in, they secure it, test it, make sure it works, and then they take the snare uh, and put it through the sheath. So using the same sheath that they used to deliver the second device, they just put a they just put a snare in and try to grab the first one. And in this case, it was able to be done successfully. Another option is to abandon the uh, lethal pacemaker. So out of the reported 115 nanostims and 12 nanostim, uh, 12 micros that were abandoned. So total 137 patients. Um, they found that there were quite a few that had a concurrent system. So either a concurrent transvenous or um, uh, many had another lethal system and there were no device interactions and no safety events reported with any of these. Interestingly, they've done cadaver studies and you can actually implant up to three micros into the same patient. Um, they just have to be about 10 millimeters apart to uh, try to avoid any electrical uh, interference. The rate of leadless uh, infections appears to be very, very low. Uh, over in a cohort of 2,500 leadless, including nanostims and micros, there is no infection that required intervention. Uh, 102, 102 of the patients in the micro study actually were considered high risk as they had prior device infection and extraction within 30 days. And in fact, about six or eight of them had uh, a the leadless put in within 24 hours of extraction of the previously infected hardware. There's only two reported cases of micro infections. The first one here is a uh, one month post leadless uh, post uh, micro implant in those MRSA bacteremia and TEE shoulder vegetation on the device, so they pulled it out and they felt this was the vegetation here. The second one was a patient who had a pocket infection. They decided to just take out the previous uh, transvenous pulse generator and leave the lease in situ, but a month later had a recurrent, uh, a recurrent infection. So uh, at the time they left the lease in situ and they decided to just put a micro as the patient was pacemaker dependent. Uh, but uh, because of the recurrent infection, they decided to take everything out including the leads and the micro. Importantly, they didn't see any vegetations on the leads or the micro, but because of the, uh, the bacteremia, they felt it was prudent to remove everything. And uh, when they swabbed the device here, they did show that there was MRSA growing on it. So the, uh, the uh, preferred mechanisms for reduced infection include a, sur a smaller surface area. So the a traditional transvenous lead has a surface area about 3,500 millimeters squared, whereas this device has about a 600 millimeter uh, squared uh, surface area. They, it's postulated that this is easier for the body to encapsulate compared to a traditional lead, so that may lead to lower infection rates. Another point that's brought up is that this sits at the RV apex where there's more turbulent flow, uh, whereas the venous system is fairly stagnant, so that may predispose transvenous leads to infection as well. Uh, you'll remember from the uh, the complication list that there was a bit of pacemaker syndrome, which can be from AV dyssynchrony. 
So what they did was pretty clever. They used the accelerometer in the micro, and they actually developed an algorithm that allowed the device to sense atrial activity. So they would sense uh, the accelerometer would pick up a little shutter in the ventricle and assume that that was atrial contraction, and then the the micro uh, times a V pace appropriately after the atrial contraction. So in this study of 40 patients uh, who are obviously in sinus rhythm and in complete heart block, they um, they test this algorithm. So this is a regular VBR50, and this is the VDD mode where it would sense atrial contraction and pace appropriately. Now their outcome was electrical. So they looked at the percent of AV pacing that was considered synchronous, i.e. within 300 milliseconds of uh, the P wave. And they, they, they defined success as more than 70% of P waves being synchronized. And they found that 95% uh, of patients actually had more than 70% AV synchrony. They did, uh, what, what they also did was they looked at, on echo, VDI mode versus VDD mode. And they found that there was a small but significant increase in the LVOT VTI, which is a surrogate of uh, stroke volume. Uh, and one other neat thing they were able to do was they, they were able to do mode switching. So in this EGM, we see one-to-one -one conduction, and then we see a P gets dropped, and then the device takes over and paces twice, and then switches the mode from, um, from VDD to VVI. So now it's just V pacing. Uh, there are some limitations of this algorithm, so it was, it's still investigational. So um, a couple of limitations they noted at higher heart rates, it's not as good as the A tends to get closer to the V. Um, however, they postulate that when during exercise, uh, it may actually be the rate response itself that's more important rather than maintaining AV synchrony. Because this algorithm was investigational, they had to do live uh, output. So the device was streaming all the data and then actually increased the current rate by about 100%. They are studying this algorithm now in a trial where they just turn it on and they're investigating clinical outcomes. But obviously this small preliminary study did not, uh, not really report uh, symptom or function, uh, functional assessments. The other approach to AV synchrony is implanting an atrial micro. Now you may wonder, this looks just like the ventricular one. And in fact, it's the same housing. The only difference is that these tines are shaped differently in order to accommodate the, uh, the atrial wall. Uh, just this month, there was an animal study that was reported in 12 sheep, uh, and uh, it was it actually worked pretty well, but uh, no reports of human implant yet. The other complication to note is cardiac failure, so pacing-induced uh, heart failure. So is there a way we can overcome this? This is an investigational uh, device called the, wire, uh, it's the wireless CRT system. It's made by EBR systems. So this device is uh, super clever. This is a, it, they compare it to a grain of rice. This is a stimulator that sits in the LV wall. And what it does, it converts ultrasonic uh, waves and converts that into a pacing spike. So the pulse generator sits above the rib cage, battery here, the pulse generator here, and it actually directs ultrasound beams towards the LV endocardium. And this tiny little electrode converts that into a pacing spike. You'll notice in this schematic, there is a co-implant because the device still needs to sense uh, RV pace and, in order, and deliver the LV pace accordingly. So this has already been studied in about 35 patients who failed convention, conventional CRT, either for anatomical reasons or failure to respond to six months of CRT therapy. They found actually a very high implant success rate in 97%. And even in this small 35 patient trial, they found that there was an improvement in EF and uh, even some uh, signs of LV remodeling. So certainly quite uh, promising. They're currently enrolling in this soft CRT trial. They've enrolled about 192, uh, 350 planned across 45 centers. Basically everyone gets the Y CRT system. Half of them get turned off as a sham. Half of them get turned which, on. After, after six months, everything gets- Which uh, patients is it, sorry? These are some images of a YCRT system. So this is the retrograde delivery sheath. They've also developed this as a transeptal approach. Uh, so the little tiny electric gets put in, and then this pulse generator gets put in here. And you see here there's a co-implant of a transvenous pacemaker. Um, but you know the, the topic of this talk was a leadless pacemaker. So could this be done totally wirelessly? 
and absolutely it can. So this is a, an example of a patient with a, a YCRT implanted here. You can see the tiny electrode here and a micro sitting in the RV. So they reported about eight patients from six European centers who've had this done. Um, all of them actually had atrial fibrillation, so there was no need for an atrial lead. Um, and the, even in this very small study of eight patients, they demonstrated um, an improvement in LVEF, uh, a, a trend towards improvement in uh, EDV and ESV, but certainly very promising results. So to summarize leadless pacemakers where we are today, <clears throat> the only one unfortunately that's available is the micro TPS by Medtronic. You know, we highlighted a few of the struggles that uh, St. Jude had with their nanosim system. These devices, as you can imagine, are still quite expensive. It's hard to find a true dollar figure, but uh, estimates have been about 10,000 Canadian for the nanostim. As we saw, there's a roughly double uh, the rate of cardiac perforation, but that's uh, offset by a longer complication, a lower long-term complication rate. The infection rate is remarkably low. The retrieval appears to be safe and easily performed. Having said that, long-term retrieval four or five years out is still unknown. So as mentioned, uh, the limitations, the cost. So they did a survey of European centers and they indicated 91% of the centers actually said that their center didn't do leadless pacemakers simply due to cost. Uh, as mentioned, the long-term data uh, is still lacking. Uh, the, the micros haven't had any reported battery failures, but again, we're only a few years out from the, the, the implant, so we may see some of this crop up. Uh, as we mentioned, AV desynchrony and pacing-induced cardiomyopathy are two limitations. Uh, that have promising uh, innovations to mitigate those uh, side effects as well. So in the end, who should get the leaders pacemaker? The ACC offers a little bit of guidance in the recommendations, the recommendation specific supportive text. They say patients who have symptomatic sinus node disease that's short lived and need infrequent single ventricular pacing, um, a leadless technique may be, uh, may be indicated, but there's no class uh, uh, assigned to this recommendation. Uh, a survey in 2018 of European centers, they basically went around and said, what features would make you want to use a leadless pacemaker rather than a transvenous? The most common responses were, uh, this is for difficult vascular access, this is for previous complicated transvenous pacemaker, and this is for infection. So those made up the bulk of the uh, clinical indications. Interestingly, permanent AFib actually was also uh, led people to more likely want to put a leaders pacemaker in because no need for uh, AV synchrony. We'll switch gears a little bit now and uh, talk about conduction system pacing. So the two we'll talk about today are his bundle pacing on the left here and then left bundle pacing on the right. So his bundle pacing involves putting a, a lead. It's a traditional lead, RV lead, but it goes into the atrium just above the tricuspid valve and using the helix tunnels into the his bundle. To help with it, there's actually two sheaths that are available from Medtronic, one that's deflectible, one that's not, to help hit the his bundle here. This is a schematic of the expected ECG changes. So in a patient with a narrow QRS, RV pacing obviously leads to a wide QRS. By V pacing leads to a less widened, but still wide QRS, whereas his bundle pacing th theoretically can actually achieve the same QRS as, uh, as, a as a native. And in fact, in left bundle bench block, the same thing, they're actually able to sometimes correct the left bundle bench block by his pacing. This is an ECG of a patient's native conduction and post implant. So you see the QRS is very, very similar, if not identical. Uh, obviously there was some sort of uh, heart block as the PR is elevated here. The PR interval has now returned to normal here because of the hispanol pacing. So does it work? Um, there's This is a 106 patient study out of five centers, 90% success rate of implanting the lead into the his bundle. The QRS uh, reliably decreases. Of course, if you start off with a narrow QRS, it doesn't change much. But if you have a bundle bench block or you have a, a, have a originally paced QRS with his bundle, the QRS nicely comes down. The LB function appears to come up quite reliably. And overall, there's been a decrease in NYH functional class as well. So certainly very promising. This is uh, a uh, 332 consecutive patients 
so what they did here was they did um, what they did. Uh, one center here does only his bundle pacing, and one center only does RB pacing, but they're actually within the same uh, healthcare system. This is uh, two centers in Pennsylvania. So they, they follow them as prospective cohorts, and they found that those who got his bundle pacing had less rates of death, heart failure, hospitalization, or need for upgrade to CRT. This is a uh, study comparing his bundle pacing versus uh, CRT. Uh, so what they did was, uh, these are patients who are CRT eligible. They implanted his and CRTs and did a crossover study. Um, they found that both groups had an improvement in EF. Uh, there was no significant difference between the improvements in both groups, but numerically the HIS actually did fairly well. And of course, the HIS system was better at uh, reducing the QRS uh, width. Two things to note. Uh, so one thing to note for this patient in the previous uh, study, uh, the two studies did show that the HIS group had higher thresholds than the CRT. So the, the average thresholds in the HIS was actually about 1.6. Is important because this actually leads to increased battery uh, drain on the device. This is a HIS uh, versus RV pacing. Uh, in this is in patients who have AV block and the EF greater than forty percent. Uh, only thirty-eight patients, and there was a the success rate was thirty-two. So thirty-two out of thirty-eight were successful. Um, they found that even this population of EF over 40, there was still a 5% increase in LVEF, and this was significant. Uh, when they looked at the patients in blue, who were the patients who had EF less than 50%, they found uh, uh, that the improvement was greater as well. So this his bundle pacing seemed to be fairly uh, good at improving EF. Uh, this is the largest cohort study available for kind of safety outcomes of his bundle pacing. On the left, are, this is threshold data. So we see between baseline and follow up, the thresholds do tend to increase a bit. The reason for this is that the his bundle is encased in fibrotic tissue. So uh, it's if the lead starts shifting away, the threshold very quickly um, starts to go up. Also, it's the target area for the his bundle is pretty small, so it's sometimes difficult to hit directly on the his. Uh, the overall complication rate is fairly low, so they noted a 92% complication free rate. The most common complication being loss of his bundle pacing. That accounts for almost 9%. So currently there, are, there is mention of his bundle pacing in the recommendations. Um, the class 2A, they say consider CRT or his bundle pacing in patients who have reduced EF and need pacing more than 40% of the time. And patients who have uh, AV node block, uh, his bundle pacing may be considered to maintain physiologic ventricular contraction, but this is a 2B recommendation. So we'll talk about left bundle uh, pacing now. The, the first reported case was actually reported in the CJC in 2017. This is a 72-year-old female who had non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, QRS is 180 at baseline. Um, so they had tried to do a his bundle pacing, but they couldn't get a good threshold. They were getting thresholds of three. So what they did was they advanced the lead into the RV, uh, and they actually found that they were able to correct the left bundle branch block. Uh, and they were able to kind of prove that this was a left bundle branch pacing. So going from left to right, this is the patient's native. What they did was they timed the left bundle uh, pacing spike. Uh, they timed the delay from the A to the V. So with a minimal AV delay, it basically paced the left bundle before the native right was activated. So it was a left to right activation pattern. So it was a right bundle branch block pattern, V1. As they delayed the pacing, then they were actually able to correct the left bundle because as the right bundle was activated, they paced the left bundle at the same time. So this, re this actually resulted in, in a remarkably narrow QRS. But as they delayed the, um, the left bundle pacing more and more, then the native right would conduct across to the left. So you get the resumption of the left bundle morphology. So the implant technique is interesting. So they just, uh, they put a pace, uh, a lead into the RV septum, they pace. So uh, the, this is a, a column B, they're pacing the right septum. So they get a left bundle branch morphology. 
and once they're there, they basically take this, they take the here the lead and apply a bit of pressure and just keep spinning the helix. Uh, it's an active fixation lead, of course. And as it goes mid septum towards the left, you see a loss of that left bundle morphology. And as you cross over to the left side, it actually becomes a right bundle morphology. That's how you know you've crossed into the left bundle system. And using this way, they also monitor the impedance. And if they notice a sudden drop in impedance, then they uh, then they assume that the helix has perforated the septum. So this is an example of a patient who's had a correction of the left bundle. So native versus intra-op and then post-op after the pacemakers uh, uh, been sewed in and everything, you see a nice correction of the QRS from 178 to 123. This is an ICE image of, uh, sorry, it, it is a, 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 a ICE image of a, the um, pacing lead. You can see it's sitting in the septum on the left side. So uh, this is a cohort of 11 patients follow over six and a half months. So in panel A, you see the NYHA has improved. So at baseline, class two, class three, and at six months, they're essentially class one and a bit of class two. So a nice significant improvement in NYHA class there. Uh, in B, uh, panel B, the BMP has improved, the EF has improved, the ES, uh, ESD has improved, and even the amount of MR has improved a bit. Again, only a small cohort of 11 patients, but certainly promising. This is some uh, 3D tissue synchronization imaging. So this is of the LV, and they show that after uh, left bundle pacing, the uh, synchrony of the LV is much improved. This is a cohort of 600 patients uh, from 2017 to 2019, mean fall of 18 months. Uh, here again, they notice uh, uh, the, the thresholds are stable. So in comparison to his bundle, where the thresholds tend to go up, they found that the thresholds were quite stable. And this makes sense. The septum has lots of muscle for the, the lead to nicely sit. The QRS obviously was, uh, was nice and narrow. Patients with left bundle branch block had a nice reduction of the QRS, whereas patients with a narrow QRS had no change. Clinically, there were improvements in EF across the board. Uh, even um, uh, for patients who had AV block um, and AV node ablation, those who had sinus node disease, there was no uh, change in EF, but their EFs were pretty good to start, 68%. The biggest improvement was in the people who had QRS more than 120. The EF increased actually from 48% up to 58. Uh, you know, and so uh, there was also interesting improvement in, in LVEDD. So some perhaps evidence of LV remodeling. The success rate was actually 97.8%. Again, using a standard uh, uh, pacing lead. So the overall safety. Uh, in March of 20, uh, 2020, there was only 500 uh, published cases that had safety outcomes. And then uh, last month, a center, a single center reported 630 patients. So we have a total of about 1,100 patients. The acute success rate has uh, been reported between 80 and 95%. The lead dislodgement rates are pretty good at 1%. Uh, the rates of septal perforation are there, but this is, these are actually uh, electrically picked up septal perforations because they're, go, they're going across the muscular uh, septum. There, there's no hemodynamic consequence at all. One thing that did come up was there is a one in five chance of temporary right bundle injury and even 8.9% of permanent right bundle injury. 1% uh, of loss of capture or threshold over three volts at 0.3% revision rate. So all very, very good. So how to summarize uh, his versus left bundle pacing. So both have potentially a role in replacing CRT. Uh, and this includes uh, patients who either need CRT for CHF, uh, patients who are having a pace and ablate strategy for AFib and heart failure, or even patients who have heart block and are expected to need high burden RV pacing for whom sometimes we consider CRT. Uh, his or left bundle branch pacing could actually replace this. His pacing has been around longer, so there is more experience with it and more data. Uh, the other benefit that's brought up is that it is more true physiologic pacing. The left bundle pacing, uh, although if timed properly, can provide right and left synchrony, really only synchronizes the left side. But left bundle pacing has many benefits, so it's easier. 
because it's got a, there's a larger target zone to hit. His target zone is actually only apparently four millimeters in diameter, and it's uh, surrounded by fibrotic tissue. The bundle pacing has less lead migration. Uh, one thing that it's not immediately thought of, but the R wave sensing is actually much better with the left bundle pacing because the his uh, lead sits in the atrium. Uh, the often uh, the R wave is quite small and may lead to kind of sensing issues from the device, whereas the left bundle uh, gets a nice, nice R wave. Uh, as mentioned, the left bundle sits, the left bundle uh, lead sits more stable in the septum, so actually has a more stable pacing threshold. Uh, having said that, true long-term data are relatively lacking for both, uh, seeing as it's only become a recently adopted technique. So overall summary of the, um, the things we talked about today, uh, the first being leadless devices. So the pro being that among the three we've talked about, leadless, hiss, and left bundle is actually still the best studied and the most available. It has less infection and less overall complication rate in the long term. However, there are more early complications, such as uh, cardiac perforation. As we noted, there is issues with dyssynchrony, both AB dyssynchrony and biventricular dyssynchrony. Again, there are uh, upcoming therapies to help deal with this. And true, true long-term data, especially regarding battery, long kind of long-term retrieval versus abandonment are still uh, in, uh, in development. The HIS bundle, the pros, so there is more experience and data compared to left bundle branch pacing and there, uh, there's theoretically better ventricular synchrony. The cons, higher threshold, as we mentioned, more dislodgement rates, and it's harder to do than left bundle pacing. In comparison to left bundle pacing, uh, higher success rate than his, less dislodgement, lower thresholds, and uh, you get still get the left ventricular synchrony. However, it's the newest kid on the block, and so it's got the, less data, the least data and perhaps the least comfort around it. And that's all I had to talk about today. Uh, thank you guys for your attention and uh, special thanks to Dr. Sadek for uh, some content review and helping with the slides. Uh, thank you, Willie. That was an excellent overview. Um, you spoke about the cost of the leadless um, systems. Just so um, we have an understanding of comparison, I think you quoted about a $10,000 cost approximately. How does that compare to what the current cost is for one of, um, you know, just a VVI pacemaker? Right. So the, the numbers I saw quoted was about a three times the cost. Um, but I, I defer to the, the EP team as to what the costs are now. Some of these uh, some of these estimates were from a few years ago. Um, and my other question is, um, with the the LV pacing, the last technology that you talked about, um, uh, you made it clear that the lead resides in the ventricular septum. Um, right. So presumably then you should have no risk of thrombus generation and needing anticoagulation? Correct. Okay. Um, there is a, a question from, um, from Dr. Mir. Um, is there, and his question is, is there any data of conventional RV leadless pacemaker lead dismodgement uh, resulting in um, a pulmonary embolism? And does the leadless CRT alternative have the device within the LV cavity and any signal of increased risk of stroke? I guess that was kind of similar to my last question. Right. The so um, <clears throat> the uh, the RV lead. So uh, on reviewing the literature, there's a couple cases of uh, there's a few where the the micro has gone and flown off into the the left pulmonary artery. Uh, the case I presented, the patient did have some respiratory failure, uh, but in all those cases, they were able to retrieve the the micro. Interestingly, with the nanostim, of the two that had the docking button uh, fly off in the artery, both were just left in the pulmonary artery. And the uh, published advice from St. Jude is that it doesn't necessarily need to be retrieved, but if the patient is running into trouble, actually just to call their on-call team and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll advise. Uh, the Leva CRT does have the tiny, it's a grain-sized, um, uh, uh, It's they call it an electrode that goes into the LV. Uh, they, there's no signal towards stroke, but again, uh, it's very small, small data points. Uh, so hard to say. In in the original uh, 37 patients, one actually did have a stroke, 
but it was felt to be from AFib as they're on IRNR. So they're on warfarin and their IRNR was somewhere in the low one range. Great. Excellent. Well, that was an excellent review. Thank you for uh, bringing us up to date on uh, all the upcoming technologies. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, everyone, for joining rounds today. Um, next week will be uh, Dr. Lawrence Lau, uh, again, one of our cardiology residents. He will be presenting on uh, endocarditis uh, along with the endocarditis team. So please join us next week for rounds and have a good week.